Ladies and gentlemen, DBNA Television is proud to bring you a Roar Media production, the nation's number one digital coaches show. If you do not know him, you better Google him. He was a high school Hall of Famer, school record holder, 10-time letter winner. He was just a boy with a ball and a young man with visions of greatness from the land of Hoosiers. When his playing days were over, he wanted to give back to the game that provided him purpose. He had found his passion on the hardwood. 14 years college coaching, multiple regional and conference championships, multiple national rank programs, coached the National Player of the Year. Winning followed him to 15 seasons professional coaching, multiple championships, multiple Coach of the Year honors, near 780 win percentage. He placed over 100 players to their respected national teams that represented their countries at the World Championships and Olympic Games. He has coached current and former NBA NBA stars. His purpose is now to serve, empower, inspire. Here he is, host of the Coach Scott Field Show. Make some noise, show some love. Host Scott Field. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. No matter where you're watching us from around the globe, I say thank you for allowing us into your homes and most importantly, into your hearts. If you're watching us on the DBNA television network, a sincere thank you. And please continue to support the network, our sponsors, and the amazing talent in other shows uh, throughout this network. If you're listening to us in podcast form, Coach Cliff and I say turn that knob up and let us put that flavor in your ear. It's crank it up, crank it up. <laughs> That's right. It's time It's time to lace them up uh, with another edition of the Coach Scott Field Show. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, next to me is Coach Cliff Livingston. Uh, most of you guys who may know basketball will know this man from winning two championships with Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, but he's currently the head coach of the Kokomo Bobcats, my old stomping grounds back in Indiana. So, Coach Cliff, welcome to the show, and uh, appreciate you jumping on with us because I know you just got off that flight and got, got settled in the hotel. Man, I, I appreciate it, Scott, man. Yeah, we just, we just flew into um, San Diego. Uh, we have four games out here uh, against the, um, the West Coast Breeze. Then we go to Las Vegas, play Las Vegas Ballers. Then we go up to San Jose and play the uh, uh, California C uh, Sea Kings. And then back down to San Diego to play the San Diego Guardians. So we're on a, uh, a, a tour of California and Vegas. And it's every other night. You know, back in the day when, when I played, we was playing all the time. So this is these guys ain't used to it every other night a game. So it's going to be interesting to see how my guys react. Well, you know what? You guys are doing an outstanding job. And for them to now have this experience to where, you know, you can now kind of show them another part of the country, uh, expose them to maybe some different foods. I mean, that's all part of the personal growth. But this is what I got to say, because uh, you guys always start off this way. What time is it? Game, Game time! time. <laughs> <laughs> Coach Cliff, yes, sir. Hey, let me tell you why this is also going to be a lot of fun today. Because about a month and a half ago, I had another Wichita State Shocker on here with me. The big dog, Antoine oh, Carr, was on with me. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, hey, now, 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 only one's missing now is Xavier. You, you got to get that triple head monster. Got to get the X Man in. Get the X Man in there. <laughs> Coach, I, I say we make that happen. But yeah, just to uh, kind of introduce and give the people a background, our viewers and our listeners, some of the younger generation was introduced to you uh, on The Last Dance, which was just an amazing documentary that showed during COVID that 10, 10 part series. Um, you, you were an integral part of that. Uh, but you played for the Wichita State Shockers, and you're actually back in your old stopping grounds out in San Diego where you played your high school ball before you went to Wichita State. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, you know, actually, it's, it's fun to come back home and visit uh, friends and family. Um, you know, my grandmother's excited for me to come back and, and, and see me back on the hardwood. She's 98. Wow. Uh, she just turned 98, and uh, she's a diehard Laker fan, and she's one of those ones who sit in front of the TV. You can't call her, and she stats, because she's statting, she's doing stats of, of the game, the whole game. <laughs> oh, she's, she's a hoop now. Like I said, when, when, it comes, when it comes in. to the Lakers, don't mess with her. 
Hey, she is locked in. Well, you know, uh, let's talk a little bit about you because Wichita State, your number 54 jersey was retired. I think you played 10 seasons in the NBA, drafted in the first round, the ninth overall pick by the Detroit Pistons. Uh, and then, you know, after a couple of seasons with the Pistons, then you were with the Atlanta Hawks where you got to team up uh, with the big dog. And then, of course, you know, you had those championship runs with the Bulls. And then you got to go overseas where I got to do a lot of coaching. Mm -hmm. You were in Greece, Italy, then you spent a year with the Nuggets and then have had an amazing journey uh, in minor league basketball with coaching, <laughs> which you've done a great job developing players. So I congratulate you on that, Coach. Um, Thank you. But like I'm saying, man, you're with those Kokomo Bobcats, which is six miles from where I grew up and went to high school. So for me to have this conversation with you, to see what you're doing with my home community, because I now live in Salt Lake City, couldn't be prouder for that community to have you as the face of the franchise to lead, guide, direct, mentor, and develop the young talent. And you guys are, you know, first in your division right now. Well, you know what, though? It's, it was when, when, I, when they asked me to come take the job, I, I was reluctant to. Uh, coach again in, in minor league basketball. I was like, I'm done with it. I'm hanging up my, my coaching shoes and I'm going to just stay on the golf course. And um, they said it was, it was a great opportunity, great, great ownership. The fans uh, in the community is, is, is all for it. So when I took a visit, when I took that visit, I kind of knew this, this is where I wanted to be because I'm the, the, you had the owners were, were over excited about this team. Um, then the mayor was, was on board with it. The community, all, all around the community was involved with it, and they were on board. So it was like a, 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 a situation where you could not say no because it's going to be a perfect storm. And then, you know, get down to Kokomo, and the love they give you in Kokomo, uh, it's unbelievable. They treat the players like rock stars. Um, go, guys go everywhere and they notice. And that's one thing when I took the job, I said, well, I want to make sure – when I do take this job, that my players are in the community visible. People know them when they see them. You know, I can say, oh, that's Hawk. Uh, oh, that's Doug. Um, you know, that's Trey. So I, I want them to know my guys by name and face. When they see them, they know them. And, and we've been in the community. We've done a lot of things throughout the community, different appearances, going to schools. I mean, that's what I'm about. I'm about the community. Don't I don't, I don't like just come to a, a, a city and just play basketball and leave. I want to come to that, that city, get involved in the community, get involved with the people who are, who are uh, um, the movers and shakers in the community, and leave an impression of we've been here, we are here, and you know that we're here. Coach, I love that because I see how active you guys are on social media. Like you say, your ownership group uh, is feverish. They, I mean, that community needed something. And the fact that you guys are now putting a product on the court that is championship caliber, uh, you know, you to be the face of the franchise. Uh, I mean, you get to play in Kokomo High School's gymnasium, which is phenomenal because People who are from that area know how much Indiana loves their basketball and the traditions. And to be a part of that and now add to the tradition with this TBL, um, Coach, you know, Dave Magley, the president, uh, you know, he's an Indiana boy himself. So I know he wants to see success in Indiana. So talk a little bit about the TBL, the league. Uh, you know, Coach Mags was on our show a few weeks ago, and we had a great conversation about the league and how it's growing and, you know, all, all the different divisions that are going on and how they maximize on this COVID time to really get involved in the community and give back to the community. So kind of talk about that a little bit, Coach. Oh, you're on mute, coach. There you go. <coughs> well, Max is the one who contacted me about the team. And Kokomo is, has such a rich tradition in basketball. I think they have like three Mr. Basketballs that came out of Kokomo High School. The gymnasium we play in, it was built in 65. To walk into that building, when I first walked in, I felt all the history and tradition in that building. And it's an old Indiana-style gymnasium. 
uh, you know, kind of like with the Hoosier movie and everything. That's right. It is a great place to play. I think right now we're averaging about between 1,800 and 2,000 fans. Wow. And, and that's them not really knowing that we're there. We're, I mean, people know we're there, but they don't know we're there. And I, I think within the last, well, our, um, right before we left, we had our biggest crowd. I think it was like 2,600 people. And they've got every, everyone who's come to the game has been so delighted about the product that we have on the floor and the way we play basketball. We play basketball old style. And they, I mean, they're telling a friend, they're telling a friend. And I think when we get back, I think our, uh, they said we're going to be like at around 3,000 to 3,200 oh, fans. Great. So it's getting to the point where we want, we want, we, our whole goal was to, 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 to get at least 4,000 fans in that building and bring it back up to the luster of it used to be. Cause you know, from what, you know, they, they tell me it used to, you have to wait to get a game, to watch a game. And they would sell, you would basically see, see half of the, um, half of the season because they double sold the season. They sold half the season to one pe so to one fans, which was a sellout, and the other half to the other fans. So it was like it was double selling the fans. So so now it's getting back to that fever's pitch again, and it's exciting because the guys we ha I have on this floor have on the floor are up and down the floor, playing above the rim, but more importantly, we play defense, and that's what's that's what's not seen a lot of uh and i think that's what we do we, we play good defense and we we make people turn the ball over and get exciting plays you know um uh, I, i'm i'm more of a traditionalist we have to be in shape we got we run we 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 i work my guys but it pays off in the game in the game because at the third quarter we may be down 15 20 you know and we can come back from that and end up winning the game uh, and we've done it several times because we outlast everyone. And by the time we how we're pushing everybody, how we're playing defense on them, making them work for every shot, then their legs run out. Their, their stamina runs out, and ours is still going. And we play about eight to ten players. I, I rotate about eight to ten players in the game. So we're really deep when it comes to uh, uh, the club. I always make sure that I have every spot is doubled. I have an opposite of every spot. If I have a score, I have a defender. If I have a defender, I'm gonna have a score on the floor. So I, 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 so when you when I sub, it's like, dang, okay, oh, whew, he's out. He's he's he was on me all the time. Then uh, you know you look and say, well, this guy ain't scoring no more. Then you got another score coming in, another guy pressing him on defense. So it's like, I'm a, I'm gonna hawk you the whole time. There's not gonna be no let up, and and that's where it's been, and that's that's why we're. We're in a position to um, really fight for a championship this first year uh, of the organization because we have a lot of talent. And I was glad that, that we were able to come out west and see other teams and how they play. So that would gear us up to what we need to adjust for for the playoffs. That's right, because, Coach, what I hear you describing – you have set the tone. You have a culture. You're going to be in great physical condition, which is going to wear the other teams down. I hear you saying that that championship DNA that you bring, that all the players know, that, hey, you were with Michael Jordan, won a championship with the Bulls. You're the face of the franchise, so there's credibility there. But I also hear you're holding players accountable and making them know what their role is and make them be great in their role and you're using that bench strength. So sounds like you're doing an outstanding job. I've seen the results. I've been following from afar and um, super excited for you. Does a lot of that come from all the years of playing at the high levels and the great coaches who you were able to learn from? Because, I, I mean, I, I look at the list. I mean, Coach Fratello. I mean, you got to be with Phil Jackson. Um, I mean, just I was with coach Chuck Daly. Coach, yes, I'm um, Daly, you know, yes. Bickerstaff. So yes. I, I, I was a lot of good coaches, but I played with six Hall of Famers. That's right. And most most players can't say they played with six Hall of Famers. They can say they played against them, but I played with six Hall of Famers, and I took a little bit of from each team I played for, 
and added that to my coaching. You know, um, the 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 athletics athleticism that that this team has is like the Atlanta Hawks, the young Hawks, the, the baby. We called them the baby birds back then. We were just just flying high, and we didn't care. We were just young and back fun. with Dominique and the boys. <laughs> yes, and then uh, a little bit. Uh, then I put a little bit of the Chicago Bulls, where you know, with playing with Michael, Michael could play forty minutes a game, and the next day he'll come to practice ready to go and practice. So our practices are, we're competitive. We're going against each other. I tell guys, look here, I don't take jobs from guys. Now, if you got somebody playing behind you and he takes your job, that's between you and him. But I make sure guys are pushing each other, working each other, getting the best out of each other. That way, when we get on the floor, it becomes easy. And that's what I learned from the, from the, uh, from the Bulls. Um, what I learned from the, 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 um, the Pistons was toughness. We have to be tough and we got to make our mental, uh, make, make teams bow down to us mentally and accept our dominance when we get on the floor. Um, what I took from the, uh, from the, the, the uh, Denver Nuggets is where, you know, our defense, the defense on the, the Denver Nuggets with Matumbo anchoring the back. So it was like we knew how to funnel everything to the middle for Matumbo to clean everything up. And that's how our defense is. So, like I said, it's a, it's a mixture of combinations of the coaches I've learned from and the players I've played with. So, I mean, like I said, it's, it's, it's a great brand of basketball. And like you said, it's a culture that I'm trying to create back in Kokomo. Um, and I want to create something that a tradition where when you come put on a, a, a Kokomo Bobcat uniform, you have a standard to live up to. There's not nothing that's going to be, um, well, subpar. Well, I, I'll get it next time. It ain't no next time. It's this time. And that's what I preach to my guys all the time. It's not the next time because the next time you can be sitting next to me the next time. So I, cause I got somebody waiting to go take your spot. So, you know, guys are, are very hungry and humble. You know, we just had, um, uh, uh, kid Eugene, Jean, uh, German was playing with us and we lost him to the uh, NBA cause he has four NBA teams he's working out for. We have another player that has two NBA teams he's got to work out for. So I'm just trying to show these young guys what they need to do to get to the next level. And that's what we've been doing, working hard at that, working hard at what we, what our face of the team is going to be and how we want people to look at us when we step on that court. Yeah, because I, I hear player development right there, right from the get-go and that competitive nature and that competitive spirit and that culture is being done by daily action. I know a lot of people throw out the term culture now, but again, that that's that culture is because of the reflection of leadership. So it sounds like, Coach, you've uh, you've got your thumbprint already on it and uh, things <laughs> are going well for you. And, you know, you talk about those Denver Nuggets. That was the Dan Issel days. Um, yes being out there so again to to be able to have learned from those coaches to learn from those players let's dissect a little bit into that um mm -hmm. you know with with the hawks coach fratello what were some of the things that you picked up from fratello and those young birds uh because again you got to team up with your former college teammate the big dog and then again you had dominique and you had doc rivers who is now an nba coach who's had great you know great success uh at that level so Tell me some of the things that you took away from Coach Fratello that you're able to incorporate into your philosophy. Well, Coach Fratello was a great um, motivating young talent. He gets the best out of his guys um, who don't know what they're doing, but he makes them makes you feel like you can do anything. Uh, you know, you know, he would always challenge us, little challenges that that that. Challenge your manhood and challenge your, uh, I would say, your, your uh, professionalism. And that's what he did. And he, he was really, really good at that. Um, now, coaching older talent, he wasn't that good at, at coaching the older guys. But the younger guys, he knew how to get the best out of them. And that's what I do right now. I, I work with my young guys. Some of the guys have never been on this kind of stage. But I'm coaching them up. And you would think they were bent on this kind of stage. And, and it's, 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 a, it's a delicate balance between making them feel that they belong and them thinking that I've made it. So I, I, I keep that, you know, you haven't made it yet. You're still working on you still you, you got a long way to go. You're scratching the surface. 
and I just keep them hungry by just keep putting that carrot out in front of them and dangling that carrot. You almost there, you almost there, and they keep working and working and working. So that's that's the fun part about um, trying to you know, when you get those young guys who's playing. You know, you 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 see the twinkle in their eye. It's like there they want it, but they don't know how to get to it. And I'm just showing them little things by little, you know, uh, things how to get there. And once they get there, they get that 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 flame in their eye, and it's like I got it, and that's the satisfaction I get. Uh, see, I think that's wonderful because I hear you describing that fire in their belly and that, you know, chip on their shoulder to want to prove you're instilling confidence into them. But you also know, too, as a coach, what you don't correct, you accept. So you got to, you know, lead, guide and direct them to make sure that you're developing, <coughs> them, you know, both on and off the court because there's so much that they have to learn because they may have raw athleticisms like sushi, but yet you got to mold it up to make it something wonderful. So that way they can be an asset to a club or franchise, either in FIBA or in the G League or, you know, that next step to that NBA, which everybody aspires to be at. But um, well, you know, I love to hear the are- stories that you're sharing. Yeah, most of most of most of my time, I tell my guys, you're really not going to be an NBA player, but you can act like an NBA player. You know, it's like I'm preparing you for professionalism, but most of you guys are going to be European, overseas, and you can make just as much money or just as good as money overseas. And my thing is to try to get the NBA looking at these guys because once the NBA look at these guys, that puts that stamp of approval on them going overseas. Yeah, that market value goes up. Yeah, it's a whole method to the madness, and they don't even know it. But (laughs) I'm always always trying to orchestrate how I move these guys. And my motto is two years, three years at most, I'll see you. If I have not gotten you to where you your your uh, your dream is where you where you uh, aspiring to go, then I'm not doing my job. So I don't you know I I plan on losing guys, bringing guys in, losing guys. I want to do that because that's telling me that I'm a good coach and I'm doing this to get these guys to the next level. Once I get these guys to the next level, other guys are going to come and want to play for me because they know that I'm promoting it and pushing them. You know I make calls for my guys all the time whether it's G League, D, uh, NBA, or overseas, I'm always promoting my guys. I'm always trying to get guys jobs somewhere because I want them to experience the things that I've experienced in my life from basketball, overseas and the NBA, because it's a lot the basketball can do for you and you can get out of basketball if you know the route to go or how to go about it. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, Coach, they're lucky to have you to lead, guide, and direct them uh, as a mentor, as a coach, as a friend. Um, I'm sure there are times where you you have to have those uncomfortable conversations to say, hey, this is what I see, and I know where, where you want to go, but let, let me guide you. You know, Will you allow me to coach you up so that way we can get you there quicker? So um, I, I, loved, I love to hear the things that you're talking about. You, know, you did talk about you know, the bowls and the things that, you know, that Zen belief of Phil Jackson and you know, being around such a competitive person like a Michael Jordan, but you look at that bowls roster that you had. I mean, you had Pippen out there with you, and you, you had Paxson with you at that time. So what were the things that you learned that, that you took to put in your toolbox that you can he- kind of feel yourself being repetitive? Like, oh, I remember Phil Jackson said this, and now you're saying it as you're trying to develop your guys. Well, you know what? It was more or less things that Michael said um, as, a, as a player. And we always had – he was competitive, and we've always, we always had drills or we had little scrimmages that we scrimmaged against each other. And whoever won can talk as much trash to the other team <laughs> as, they, as, as they wanted to. Yeah. And you have to listen to it. So every chance we, we, we got a chance to beat them, we talked as much trash because we knew the next time we play them, they're going to get in our tail and give us a thrashing. And <laughs> that's, what I, that's one of the things I've been instilling to my guys. I like them to have chippy, be chippy and, and, and going at each other, you know, trying to make each other, you know, get on each other's skin and push each other because – one thing I've learned about with the Bulls practices and Phil, the harder you go in practice, the easier the games become. Because if you think about it, you're going to practice, you're going to practice for 45, 50 minutes hard, straight. In the game, you're only going three to seven minutes. 
So if I can go three to seven minutes hard as somebody and and do my job and come back out and wait for the next three to seven minutes, that's good for, for the starting team because they get a chance to get a breather without a letdown. And then also what that does is it makes team unity even stronger. You know, you know what guys are going to do at any given time, in any given situation, because you're running your plays every day. I, and they're, they're scoring and trying to score when they're facing someone who knows the plays, exactly what's going to happen, and, and trying to stop it. So if you can score in that kind of uh, scenario, just think when opponents is guessing what you're doing, what you can do to them. So that's why I tell practice, guys, you got to go hard at practice. You got to go at guys hard. You got to make it difficult for them to score. You got to make it difficult for them to play defense against you because the opposition doesn't know what you know because you see it every day. They see it every once, maybe once a week or once every now and then when they play you. So it's, it, that's what I learned from, the, from being with the Bulls and, and Phil. Phil had us going at each other. I mean, me and Scotty used to almost get in a fight every day <laughs> because my job was to rough them up, play aggressive on them, and make him a better player. Not only did he did doing that, but it made me a better player because I became a better defender because I got to go against a Scottie Pippen every day. Every day, yeah. So that makes you a, a lot better player when you're going hard at someone like that. So like I said, it was it was a it was one of those things that I cherish those 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 times when we did that because now I teach these to my my guys. They don't these young guys don't really get it. They 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 it's. It's like, well, why, why we got to go hard at each other every day? Why, we don't need to go at each other. But no, you don't understand. The big picture is at the end, that's where it's going to pay off later on down the road. You know, I always tell my guys, I have a saying, I always say it's greater later. And they didn't understand greater later. I said, look here, the hard work you put in right now is going to be late, later on. It's going to pay off. It'd be greater down the road. So now, now I got all the guys saying it's greater later. It's greater later. I like it. You're, you're inflicting your will there. But a couple of things that I took out of that, because, again, this is coach speak here. But, you know, coach led teams can be very good. But when you have a quality player and it's a player led team, then you can have greatness there because they're going to push and hold each other accountable as a Michael Jordan did on the court and in the locker room to challenge you guys on a daily basis. So I love hearing those things. And the fact that I also took. And again, this is because, again, coach speak, but I hear you talking about how hard you're going in practice because what that's going to do is now when the game situation comes, it's going to slow the game down for them and they're going to see more things on the court. They're going to have more aware spatial awareness on the court, but yet those comparative spaces competitive spirits through repetition and through habits through hard work is going to make that byproduct of winning so much easier to attain. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? That is exactly what, what, what you're hearing. And I told these guys, I said, you know what? I'm, it's not about me. It's about you guys. I said, right now I'm trying to build you guys and, and show you guys how to do the things the right way, uh, a different way. Um, a lot of them, um, I've been used to doing it a certain way, playing a certain way, and I'm breaking it down. I'm breaking them down to build them back up to show them there's an easier way to do this. And I'm going to show you the easier way, but I can only show you in pieces because if I try to feed you a whole pie, you'll get sick. Try to eat a whole pie, you get sick. So you can go slice by slice. We're working on this right here. Okay, now we're going to work on this part of the game. We're going to work on the mental part of the game. Are we going to work on how to how to uh, run a game and, and and dictate a game? So I'm feeding them little bit by little bit, and as the season is coming along, it there it, it's all going to come together in, in a combination right at the right time, and that's when it, everything clicks, and that's when you start really gelling and and your team excels from that point. That's when it's like a rocket just taking off because now everything comes together, why we did everything and how we did everything. It's like, oh my gosh, this is like too easy now. And they don't <laughs> understand how game, how the game becomes a lot easier when you yeah. slow the game down. Well, and, and, and I think it's all coming from your leadership because you have that vision. You've been there. You've, you've grabbed that brass ring and now you're trying to take them to the jewelry shop. 
So, yes. you know, I, I love to hear what you're saying. And I know it may sound repetitive with me repeating with my comments, but I, I love the conversations that we have for anybody out there who's watching. Again, this is uh, Coach Cliff Livingston, who uh, won two championships with the Chicago Bulls, uh, now head coach of the uh, Kokomo Bobcats uh, there in Indiana, who's now on the road uh, on a West Coast swing. Uh, coach, these stories are great, and these viewers are going to have tools for their toolbox. And to me, that's what this show is all about. We're positive. Uh, you know, we're empowering. And if people take the time, and I implore them to take the time to listen to these lessons, because why not get them from someone who's been there, done that, and have attained the things that these guys can only dream of? So for you to share these stories with us, Coach, uh, I'm well, very, you know, very, I, I, I want to I add something. I, I try when I when I'm I'm a I tell people I'm a teaching coach. I'm more of a of a teaching coach, not just a coach to X and O's and get guys out there playing. I'm a teaching coach. You know, our practices are how we do our plays is we break it down in halves. We run the front half of a play. So guys can see the options um and and see how to get their their points in the flow of the game, opposed to seeking um how to get points, you know, guys are following the ball, chasing the ball. No, I'm going to show you how to get the ball off the flow of the, of, of, of the, of the plays. And then we'll do the backside so they can see the, 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 the swing action on the opposite side, on the weak side of how to swing the ball to the opposite side and attack from the, from the weak side. You know, everyone wants to attack from the, from the front side. You know, right now it's a lot of standing around watching everybody play basketball. Well, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a traditionalist. I, I, I play basketball from 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 left to right or right to left, inside out, not outside in. You know, every all these young kids now want to run to the three point line and shoot <laughs> the three point line. Yeah. And you know, another thing I would say is, you know what, fellas, you can shoot two threes out of ten. I can shoot eight out of out of uh, of ten mid range. I'm going to beat you every time. So I, I call that the twos and fuse. If I can get the twos and fuse and get to the basket and get some and ones, I'm always going to beat you. The old old style, and and that's what I'm trying. These guys are finally starting to buy in. You know, you know, we we start off shooting forty threes, and I'm like, that's just entirely too many threes, too many threes. So I, I'm trying to get us down to like the twenty two to twenty five range threes, but I want threes that are when we swing the ball, swing the ball, and come back. It's wide open threes opposed to you got a man in your face. You try to break somebody down and shoot over them. So it's, it's a, it's a new call. It's a new culture of, of them playing basketball, but I'm trying to infuse a little bit of old school in there, wisdom in there with it. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, sometimes it's a struggle to get them to understand why did you take the three? You know, I, I tell them all the time, you guys are talented. You guys play the game better than we've played the game but you don't understand the game. And that's the difference. When you understand the game, a player who's talented can be phenomenal, but a guy who understands the game, he can compete with that guy who's talented and stay with that guy who's talented. So those are the things that I'm trying to instill in these guys. I want to instill that you can have your creative talent, but understand why and how you're doing things. When you do that, that makes the game fun and it makes it easier for you to play. I love it. And coach, the best coaches are the best teachers. Because when you can sit there and break it down and show them step by step in progression, crawl before you walk, walk before you run, it's going to make that visual because I, I feel like today's players are so visual because of all the technology that's out there. So there's no doubt you're doing an outstanding job as a teacher. But I also hear a lot of, we have a common acquaintance, Tex Winter. You yes. got to be with Tex Winter. Yes. And I, I remember spending three years in the summers out there with Tex Winter when he was with the Lakers and where they would sit there and go over that triangle offense with no ball on just passes and cuts yes. and reads and then have that player movement on that offside, weak side action to where, because <laughs> if you're just standing, you're too easy to defend. But I also hear that Tex Winter influence there. So I just wanted to bring that up because to me, to hear the things that you're saying, I, I love to hear it because it's reinvigor reinvigorating the, the passion and purpose in me and my teaching style and how we coach. So, Coach, it, it's well, wonderful see, to hear those things. Well, well, my first year my first year with the Bulls is, you know, um, 
learning that that triangle was was difficult. Oh yeah, and I wasn't. I mean, I, I'm I'm not a the 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 most brightest player on the court, but I know <laughs> I'm not, not the slowest player on the court. Learning, and that 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 whole triangle thing just threw me for a loop. And what Tex did, he took us into the office, and he broke out the projection. The old <laughs> black and white. He broke it. He brought that out. And he broke it down to us how the front side of the triangle, the middle of the triangle, and the back side of the triangle. And once we saw that, he broke, like I said, once he broke it down to how to play it and how to how to run it, it was like a light came on with the whole second unit. We started clicking. We started understanding how to make that that make it work for us. The, you know, the blind pig, the oh. uh, the the the, <laughs> the uh the uh front side triangle it was it was like once you get it it's poetry in motion yeah it, it, if you don't, it, if you that, don't do it right it's like the keystone cops you're sitting there using that terminology and all of a sudden my mind drifts to oh how about that pinch post you yes, know the pinch <laughs> post, that yes, up because again, you're going to hit that wing the, po the point guard is going to go to the corner there's your triangle now your weak side action and then again it's all going to be predicated off the reason what the defense gives you right. but yet put the player put the ball in the player's hands when he's at his highest percentage and can get to his spots so there's right. just reads within that so i love hearing the, oh, this this is just such a fun conversation because <laughs> again we're, we're just chopping up and i'm sure if we were sitting here eye to eye we'd probably have little sugar packets or mints you know, and slide, right. slide across slide the desk. <laughs> and, 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 believe, and, and it's funny because i do that a lot I'm yeah. explaining something. I'm like, okay, let me pull this over here, pull this over here. Okay, now this guy goes here, goes, and you know, okay, well, what about if he goes here? Then you got this right here. You got a back door cut here. You know, you got you got a ball, a, 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 a ball cut right here. You know, you got a UCLA cut here. I mean, it's it it it's when I get to talking about basketball, like I said, I, I tell guys, you know, I, I I love what I I love basketball and what it's done for me. And for me not to pass the knowledge that I have that I've learned from this game and not pass it down to the next generation is selfish of me and wrong for the sport because the sport needs to make sure it keeps going and perpetuates. And, you know, everything goes full circle with basketball. That's Amen. why the basketball is round. It goes full circle. Come back around to the start. Amen. Steel serpent steals and one man's candle does not go out because he ignites another candle. You there know you what go. I'm saying? There you <laughs> go. <laughs> Coach, I love it, brother. This is so much fun. Uh, I mean, again, you, you've got so much background and you have so much experience. And so to sit here and, and chop these things up is just just fun for me. Uh, you know, talk about Chuck Daly. What were some of the things? Because man, you think about Chuck Daly. I mean, he was he was Pat Riley before Pat Riley because the hair was always perfect, the suit was always looking nice. Well, you and know again, what? No, I'm going. I'm going to I'm I'm correct you on that one. Give Pat me. Riley was first, and then Chuck Daly. Yeah, okay, okay. So I'm, I got I got I got to get Pat his his, his part. <laughs> Pat was Pat was the originator. Chuck Daly was right after him. And what I like Wall about Street. Chuck was what I like about Chuck is he was a, a players coach. Yeah. He understood how to play players, when to rest them, uh, uh, what positions to put them in. And, you know, um, we, we would always we, – we called him Daddy Rich because he made the game fun because he always had a shooting game for some money. Oh, there you and go. He used to always say, money on the wood, make it all good. <laughs> so down, so guys, go. guys would be like, okay, oh, I'm, I'm ready for that one because I, 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 I got to win this money. I got to win this money. It wasn't the fact that it was big money. It was the, the he, he brought the competition part to it. The money made you focus a little bit more so you have more bragging, bragging rights. But it wasn't really, I mean, we were all making good money back then, but, you know, $10 here, it was like, oh, wow, I, I, I want $10. I beat you out of $10, you know. So it was, that's what he was, he was good at, at, at the mental part of, of, of making guys um, uh, compete, uh, individually against each other. Yeah, just as he did with the Dream Team in 92. But you were also with Isaiah Thomas and Vinnie Johnson and, and that group. What were things that you picked up from those guys? Well, you know what? What I, what I picked up from Isaiah, Isaiah was just tenacious. He he didn't care how big you were, how how small you were. 
he was going to bring his best game and it didn't matter who's in front of him. You know, he didn't, he didn't play down to the competition. The competition played up to him. You know, um, Benny Johnson, what I learned from Benny Johnson is when you went off the bench, you got to be ready and you got to be instantly, instantaneously ready. When you come off the bench, you got to go off, come off the bench, go in there, make an impact and come back and wait for the next time. You got to you know, go back in the game. His thing was, you will know I've been in the game when I leave, when I, when I leave the floor. And, and that's what I took from Benny. And that's what I, I patterned myself after Benny when, when it came to I come off the bench. Cause when I came in the game, you knew I was in the game. You may thought I played 20 minutes. I've only played like eight to 12 minutes, but it, it seemed like I played 20 because I left it all on the floor and I, I, I did everything I could possibly do to make sure my team was energized and revitalized. See, he was the microwave. He warmed it up in a hurry. In a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you go. Well, then, how, how, I mean, you, you think about Bill Lambeer and that toughness and how, you know, back in the 90s, you know, you came into the paint, you know, there was going to be some contact. I mean, that's the way the game was played back then. But what were some of the things, you know, on or off the court that you took from Lambeer? Because Lambeer is now coaching, you know, in, in the WNBA and has had success. But being on the court competing and practicing against him on a daily basis because you, you talked about Scottie Pippen and, and you know how he helped you become a better defender because you're pl playing against one of the you know top 50 players of all time but what about a Bill Ambeer I mean that's just toughness when I think of that name <laughs> well well Bill Bill was one of those guys is he finds a way to get into your head the opposing team's player head and his thing was if I can get in his head I got him and he would do things to you so you won't be worried about trying to score on him. So he would hit you somewhere or bump you somewhere. Now you're thinking about beating him up or not getting to that pole, that play, that, 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 that play. So now he won because he mentally imposed his will on you to not score on him. Because Bill, you know, really couldn't jump much, but he knew how to position himself for rebounds to get rebounds. He knew how to position himself for defense. Did you think that he's playing defense, but he's really not playing defense? <laughs> but he'll give and you that bump to make you make, you, make you feel it. Feel it. There. <laughs> so what I learned from Bill is how to how to make guys not go to their strengths, but you make them go to their weaknesses. Yeah, yeah. And that's what he was. He was a mental. He taught Dennis Rodman a lot of stuff. Dennis Rodman learned from him very that's well. That's right. Yeah, you know, especially where, later on in his career when he was with the Bulls and they oh. won those championships. Because think about that final series out here with the Jazz where he got in Carl Malone's head by just being that like a rock in his shoe where you just always knew it was there. Well, you know, he, what he did what he did to Carl is he made Carl not go to his strengths, which was posting up on the block and running the rim to rim. He slowed him down by bumping him, running the rim to rim. And on, on the block, he was just all over him on the block. He was just 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 pestering, pestering him. He wasn't really playing defense. He was just pestering him. And, you know, now he's thinking, now Carl is thinking, damn, he's over here. What, what I do now? He's going to be over here. He's going to be over here. So now you're already thinking about, he's not really thinking about how he used to just overrun everybody. He just, just bulldozed everyone. He couldn't bulldoze Dennis because Dennis had him mentally locked. And, yep. and, and, and most people don't understand, the mental part of the game is the toughest part of the game to be. If, if, That's if right. I Especially at that elite level. That's oh, right. Yeah, because yeah. you think about it. Everyone was the best athlete coming out of college. You know, some form, they were leading their school and this, this, and this. But now what separates the, the guys from up here, way up here, the, 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 the magics and the birds, is the mental part. That yeah. separates the good players from the, from, from the okay players are have learning to have an edge on your, your, your opponent. And that's what, that's what Dennis was. Dennis was great at it. He took Lambert, Lambert taught him and took it to a whole nother level. You see, I love that because what I'm hearing there is, you know, in the NBA, that, that's an elite level. I mean, that's a 2%. But to be that, that 0.5% of elite players and to have that attention to detail to know to just slow him down and be physical in front of him so Carl couldn't run rim to rim to get that easy outlet pass for an easy layup or catch it, get the guy sealed behind you where now it's just, you know, catch, quick move, you know, quick hook or whatever. Again, those attention to details are what you're now teaching to your guys to make them better players so that way they can gain that half step advantage and to slow the game down to make them a better player to help them understand the flow of the game 
Well, you know, and that, that's what and that's what I've been doing a lot of teaching the game uh, on the post and on the wing. You're like my guys. I told I told them you uh, uh, if you're a shooter, you should be watching Reggie Miller. Ooh. Reggie Miller is a guy that comes off the screen and just lets it go, and he knows it's good because his footwork was impeccable. He knew how to come off a pick. He comes off that pick shoulder to shoulder. And he's going to put that inside pivot foot down. So as soon as he catch the ball, it's gone. Yeah, in rhythm. Yeah. He was in rhythm because, that, yes. that, like you said, that inside foot pivoted. His shoulders were square. Quick release. Boom, well, baby. Well, a lot of these guys, they jump to the shot and get set and then shoot. Yep. And I'm trying to show them that, that two-tenths of a second of getting your shot off is different from getting it off or getting it blocked. And I'm going to show you how to get your shot off faster but also with a rhythm that you can let it go and you know it's gone and it's good. Yeah, because shooting is shooting is such a rhythm, and then they're hopping into that shot. They mm -hmm. they don't have the balance that they right. should have for proper mechanics, and oh, yeah. that's that, that. There's your teaching point right there. And coach, this is so fun. <laughs> what are you see? What are you seeing from the new school players of today compared to just like 10, 15 years ago? And how and what are you learning from today's players that's making you a better teacher and a better coach? Well, you know, what what I what I learned what I'm learning about the, the these new the new school is they're athletic. Athleticism's off the charts with these right. guys. They they can mimic anything. You show them anything, they can mimic. They can mimic it. But um, you know, what that's what I like about it. You can show them a move or show them, they can mimic the move. But what I'm now, what I'm, what I try to do is now teach them why they do it or how to get into it. You know, um, they're so quick at their feet and, and, and moves. I mean, it's, it, it's lightning quick opposed to guys with set up like a Larry Bird. He take his time and he gets you in, he'll show you a fake. And if you don't go for it, he's shooting it. If you go for it, he's going to give you the up and go up, go by you. Well, these guys, they just blow by you. They don't even set things. Yeah, one speed. Blow. They just, they're so fast. Yeah. So I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to, I'm trying to learn and teach these guys how to slow it down just a little bit so you can get more separation when you do do your fakes or you do make your jab step. You can get more separation opposed to just, off your athleticism, you just beating guys off your athleticism. Yeah, work. Yeah, work that, that, those are some things. Th those are some things that I see when I'm at the NBA Summer League every year because I was wow. blessed to have been with the Golden State Warriors for three summers with <laughs> the Sat Kings, and I see everybody just trying to do too much, too quick, out, out of control, and just slow down instead of controlling tempo and pace. They're they're just trying to emulate everything that they see on Sports Center, and that may not be what's indicative or good for their game. And they're just it's just basketball. It's not rocket science. Slow down. Do what you do well, and get to your spots and make good decisions to make your teammate a better player. And to me, that's that's the most important thing. Well, a lot of a lot of guys, like I said, it's a lot of young guys don't understand that they just go 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 without a purpose. You know, I, I tell my guys, work smarter, not harder. When you learn how to work smarter, not harder, the game comes to you. You don't have to chase the game. And a lot of these young guys, they chase the game because they feel they got to shoot in volumes. Yeah, don't in let the game come to them. If, if you learn how to let the game come to you, you'll see it's the shots that you take, the quality shots you take. You don't have to take as many shots. You can work on other things other than just trying to shoot the ball. You can work on your defense. You can work on your defensive steals. You can work on your block shots because you're not trying to take volume shots. You're not always thinking about offense. I got to shoot the ball. I got to shoot the ball. Yeah, see, I love that. And and I'm also thinking, too, because you mentioned Larry Bird. Matter of fact, if if my memory serves me correct, you were part of the Hawks when Larry Bird went off for those that 60 points and the whole bench went going crazy. And I think Fratello had to find everybody on the bench because Larry was just doing his thing in New Orleans. Can you can you share some of those those stories with us? Because oh, yeah. I mean, well, he, he was know, just unbelievable that night. Well, you know what? It, <laughs> it all it all said it was all how it all come about was Mikhail had scored 58 points the game before. Yeah. And Larry told Mikhail, and he publicly put it out there, I'm going to outdo that score. I'm going to outscore you the next time we play. 
what happened to be against the Atlanta Hawks. And <laughs> we were playing New Orleans because Ted Turner had sold a buddy of his 12 games in New Orleans. So we played 12 games in New Orleans. And it was happened to be at uh, uh, you know, Arena, a University of New Orleans uh, Arena. So the game start, Larry's just, I mean, he's making everything. I mean, everybody. I guarded him. Kevin, uh, I mean, uh, Antoine guarded him. Um, Ricky Brown guarded him. Sly Williams guarded him. I mean, everybody had some of that 60. He gave everybody. He, 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 it was like he just spread the wealth to everyone. Well, it was one play that um, that Antoine Gar was, Carr was guarding him. And Antoine let him get, get the ball, and he was shooting the three. And Antoine ran at him hard. Fouled him. He fell into our trainer's lap. It was an N one three point shot. That's when I got off the bench. I'm waving a towel, slapping the other high fives down the bench, and we having a good time. Well, the next game we played against um, Indiana Pacers. So uh, Patella told me, Ricky Brown, Sly Williams, uh, Eddie Johnson to meet in uh, his room after we get out. You know, if we get settled in our, our room, come up to his room. Um, and, and we went up there, he had the game on. We sit on the couch, elbow on each other, like laughing, just Man, look at that, look at that. Mike Patel said, man, look at it. He's kicking our tail, just wearing us out. And you guys on the bench, high-fiving each other. That's going to cost each one of you guys a hundred dollars. <laughs> I left out of the room and said, that's the best hundred dollar seat I ever had. <laughs> <laughs> oh, coach! Watch, watch Larry and Mo. He's like poetry in motion. I mean, I've had, we've had, I've had some great games against the Celtics. Uh, you know, it was part. Of, I've been part of great games against the Celtics. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I game, uh, game seven um, of the uh, eighty four, no, eighty six uh, championship game. Dominique and 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 uh, Bird going back and forth. That was an f- unbelievable game. We ended up losing the game. Um, even after we was up, we was up three to one in the series, and we ended up losing that game. But that was a great game. I mean, and other games when when he would tell you he's going to shoot the ball off the off the glass on the right side, and you know, I'm guarding him like the hell if you are, I'm on him like glue. Like he owed me he owed me twenty dollars. I'm, I'm following him everywhere. He went down and set a down screen, set a cross screen, set a back screen. I said like, okay. Phew. He's away from the place I ain't worried about. Next thing you know, I get a back screen. I'm saying, I'm fighting over the back screen, trying to get there. He gets the ball. He looks at me, too late, shoots off the glass. <laughs> I mean, Larry was 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 one of he was one of those guys who who was was slow, but you know what? He knew how to play the game before you even got got to him. Yeah, he he knew he knew the game. He studied the game. He knew the angles, and oh, he knew he knew how to get his shot off. And he was going to tell you about it. Yes, and let you know, <laughs> let you know every time. Oh, uh, coach, this has been so fun. Uh, <laughs> we we we, we got to have you back and, and do some more of this because I mean, we got to talk some coaching. We got to tell some stories. Again, we haven't even scratched the surface. So um, I know. Hey, you hey, know, hey, it, it seems like seems like time flies when you, when you when you when you really into talking about basketball just like time just takes off where'd it go just evaporated hey i i feel like a young man on christmas eve waking up for christmas <laughs> and you're so excited that next thing you know christmas is over and you're like dang i gotta wait 365 more days to get that again <laughs> <laughs> oh coach this this has been fun uh i appreciate your time ladies and gentlemen this is cliff livingston uh NBA champion, uh, TBL head coach of the Kokomo Bobcats. We've been chopping it up here for the last hour. I've had a lot of fun. In about two minutes, leave us with another nugget for our viewers and our listeners. And coach, we're going to get you back on to chop it up and do some more of this. All right, let me. I, I'll give you a Michael Jordan story. Oh, got to, got to. All right, we were, we you know we were in practice, going at we were scrimmaging, and it was a it was a timeout. Um, and Michael walked over to me. He said, "The ball will go to Stacy King. I'm gonna steal it, go down and dunk." I'm like, "Yeah, okay, all right." So we go back on the court. Ball went up down a couple of times. Then I looked at Michael, did like this, give him in the face. The next play, the ball went to to uh, Stacy King. 
He spun middle and then came back baseline. Michael stole it, went down and dunked it, and did like this to me. <laughs> so it was like, he's one of those guys who who's played the game in his mind several times over and over. It's like he's been there before. And, you know, uh, I always say, you know, playing with Michael, it's like he's in a time warp that he's just come back, time travel, come back, and play the game to go back forward, to play some more, to come back, to play some more, uh, show you guys, you know, this is what I know. He he knew he knew every play that was going to happen before it was played. Wow. That, you, coach, that's visualization at its optimal peak. And oh. to know the game and understand the game and play that out after he visualized it and told you he was going to do it and then do it, Man, that's special, special right there, brother. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Wow. Coach, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Good luck this weekend. I, I know you're going to be teaching those guys up, and those Bobcats are going to learn a lot under your tutelage. Um, I'm, I'm going to be in touch with you, and we're going to get you back on so we can tell and share more stories like this because, again, <laughs> we didn't even scratch the surface, brother. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, Scott. Hey, you take care. Hey, great show. Um, keep doing what you're doing, but more importantly, keep teaching the game. God bless you, coach. Keep doing what you're doing. You're inspiring. You're empowering. You're you're mentoring, and that's what a coach is. So to sit there and, and share this time with you today, I'm blessed, and I'm going to be better because of this time I got to spend with you. Ladies and gentlemen, again, Cliff Livingston out in San Diego getting ready for some TBL action with the Kokomo Bobcats. Stay tuned for another exciting episode of the Coach Scott Field Show, and if you keep watching, Coach Cliff's going to be back on there with us. We'll see. We'll see you soon. God bless. Be safe. All right. Likewise. Likewise. All right. Now. Bring it in. Thank you for watching the Coach Scott Field Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DVNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production. Don't forget to subscribe to the Coach's YouTube channel. Like and follow him on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Have yourself dressed and ready to go in the locker room for the next exciting show coming soon. Thank you for watching the Coach Scott Field Show, the nation's number one digital coaches show. This DBNA television broadcast is a Roar Media production.